years younger than me, was going to kindergarten, you went in and the teacher did a little readiness thing. And if you didn't pass, the teacher said, come back. It didn't go into a computer database. But all of these are online assessments. And you guys are doing it in conjunction with the state of Ohio. And here's what you're doing. You're assessing all children from birth to age six. We talked about the kindergarten entry assessment. The principles of the assessments are that the assessments are aligned to the Common Core Standards. They're going to assess the social emotional development of the children, the physical and motor development of the children, the language and literacy development of the children, the mathematical thinking of the children, the scientific thinking of the children, social studies and the arts, and everything in the assessment is linked to your state longitudinal data system. So from birth on, what we're doing is starting to sort the children that we're, we're starting to measure them from birth on and build a profile of each child. Uh, your, this was a newspaper article, How States Plan to Assess Kindergarten Readiness, and what it said was that Maryland is using an adaptation of the work sampling system as its readiness assessment. In other words, the kids color a page, and then the teacher looks at that and makes a decision about what that means and how, the, how well the child is doing whatever, which takes us back to that human subjective judgment. It's a work sampling system. Um, teachers conduct observational assessments. Children are categorized as fully ready, approaching readiness, or developing readiness. Now, one of the things that has surfaced when you do this is that if a child can be very bright, but if the child's personality and the teacher's personality rub, that affects how particularly a kindergarten child is assessed, because it's not like they can sit down and take a paper and pencil math test. That, I don't like you, but you passed the calc test, so I'm stuck. This is all strictly the teacher is looking at work sampling, what kind of work sampling, think about these are pre-kindergarten kids, and making a decision. So it's purely subjective from the earliest stages. It's coupled with the development of your kindergarten entrance assessment. You'll have formative assessments. The assessments will be computer-based, and data across all the domains will be captured by an online system. So that assessment goes into the computer base and follows your child forever. Project number seven was your child development innovations. You had uh, mental health consultations, and it, it moved into social and emotional foundations of learning. And that was a uh, online collection and data analysis system that goes into your longitudinal data system, Early Childhood Data Warehouse. That's what your Early Childhood Data System is called. This is your Early Childhood Data System. You can see on uh, the left-hand side is the program's identification number. On the right-hand side is the unique student ID that goes into the Data Warehouse, follows, you've got a school readiness assessment, and then it follows them into the K-12 through database. So they go in in early childhood and it follows them then the whole way through using the, the data warehouse and then moving them through. You linked it in 2007, so every kid it has a number. The state is developing a next generation data system that's scheduled for completion in 2015. It's supposed to improve your data collection. The department will expand, expand the collection of information on individual children to include children who are enrolled in daycare centers, not just in uh, Head Start or a school-sponsored pre-kindergarten program, but anybody who's any kid who's in any daycare center will now be included in the program as well. Project 10 is your early learning data system, and that's they're talking about the expanded one. And what they say is that they will establish interfaces with early childhood data sources maintained outside the Department of Education. That includes the mental health program, it interfaces to the Department of Health, uh, mental hygiene, to kids who've been adopted, health screenings, immunization. So what the plan is in your this new data system is not just education data, but they're interfacing with all of the other state agencies. So we have one complete data dossier for every child from birth on. <clears throat> now, we talked about the testing and how important the testing is. So I went looking at how you guys score your tests. Now PARC, which is the consortium that you're joining, they're going to do computer adaptive testing. That means that we diagnose how well the students are taking the test, and we adjust the test while the child is taking the test to match the questions to what they can answer. So you diagnose how well children are meeting the standards and adjust in real time 
the rigor and content of the items presented to the students based on the students' previous responses. That's a quote. So if you're doing fine with 20 and 20 is 40, good for you. But if you're struggling, we can move that to 2 plus 2 is 4. But you still got the same number of right. right now, you have a Maryland system of assessment. It's a Maryland school assessment. You began it in 2003. And it said that you're, it's driving improvements. And what you are doing in Maryland very nicely is reducing achievement gaps. The federal government mandated that all the states reduce the gaps in achievement from the lowest performing children to the highest performing children. There's two ways to do that. I can move the bottom up, or I can move the top down. In Maryland, what your high school assessment said, and this is right off of your own state's website, is your high school assessment passing scores were set by Maryland teachers at a level they determined virtually all students could achieve. The scores don't identify letter grade performance because most of the questions must be set at the difficulty level of the passing standard. So if everybody can get a D, we made that passing. If everybody could get a C, we made that passing. We set the passing standard at the level virtually all students could achieve. I have to tell you, when I read that for the first time, I actually laughed out loud. I called my math daughter and said, oh, honey, you should have gone to school in Maryland. <laughs> you would have loved it there. <laughs> Do you think we take the test as many times as they want now? It's summative. The Governor's Success Task Force says that Maryland is going to partner with P through 20 discipline place groups to ensure that the high school assessments of the Common Core State Curriculum build on the rigor of your existing assessments and serve as college readiness tests for all students. To this end, you're working in your state with all the colleges to implement policies that place students who meet the consortium adopted achievement standards for each assessment into credit bearing college courses. Now let's think this through. The math is two years behind. So if you're two years behind, Algebra 1 would be an 11th grade math. Advanced placement math then would be Algebra 2. And the colleges will say, that's a college credit course. If the consortium is lowering the level of what they have to achieve in order to graduate, and if you're working with the colleges, to say these, what this is going to be the college entrance level, the next step will be college level courses. We're not moving the bar up, we're moving the definition for success down. Now, my own state of Pennsylvania actually debated the Secretary of Education the other week on this. And in the course of the debate, the proponents said, well, no, no, you're, you're, you're so exaggerating. They can still take AP Algebra 2. I took Algebra 2 in 10th grade. Three of my six are engineers. They all took Algebra 2 in 10th grade, too, so that they could get to calculus before they graduated from high school. Currently, if you're taking Algebra 2 at the college level, you are in a remedial class. It is not credit course. It's remedial math, because college level math begins a calculus. But this is saying, no, no, no. In the language arts and in math, the colleges are going to implement policies so that students who meet these new achievement standards for each assessment, they'll be placed right into credit-bearing college courses. So courses that used to be remedial will now be for credit. It isn't that it came up. It's that we move what we call success down. And remember your definition of college and career ready? You can take a credit general education course at any college. Now it's for credit. So what we're doing is the colleges, that's that, in the very beginning we saw the pre-K through K through 12 into college. The colleges slide into this too, and everything shifts down. All of the standards shift down. This is your Race to the Top grant application. 
It was signed in May of 2010 by your governor and your chief state school officer and the president of your state board. <clears throat> now, the race to the top application didn't just say it was true. They also had to sign that they certified that they actually read the application, that they were committed to it, and that they supported its implementation. And they had to say that before they got the money. In other words, we're going to do this whether we get the money or not. Now, Maryland, you actually got the money. You got phase two money. You got basically $250 million. You got 12.5% of that initially, and then your award letter said that the balance will be made available after the United States Department of Education receives and reviews the final scopes of work for all of Maryland's participating local education agencies. So your local school district is now directly accountable to the federal government. The federal government had to receive and approve what your local school district said they were going to do in order for your state to get the rest of its race to the top money. And that held true in every single state that got this, this funding. So when they say this isn't a federal initiative, this is the federal government talking directly to your local school district, saying we approve or disapprove what that local school district is doing. And that local school district must meet our federal standards before the state can get its money. The preliminary scope of work that the districts had to sign said that the school districts had to do all of the race to the top plan. In other words, a district couldn't say, well, I like this part, but this part's kind of silly, so I'm not going to do it. No, you had to do all of it. Every state, all the school districts had to say that they would do all of the plan. And they had to sign in their memorandum that they would, in fact, do so. Part of the things that the school districts had to agree to was to make their data available to researchers. And that was a requirement of race to the top. Now, I told you I attended training sessions. I know this is very poor quality. It was a training session with a PowerPoint. I took a picture of a slide and made a slide of my picture of my slide. But I wanted you to see the original. And this was on the reading, because we spent a lot of time talking about math, so I thought we should talk a little bit about reading. Now, on the left side, that was what they called the old way of teaching reading. And what they said is, there's a, you would read a story, and the kid would get a question like, the baker most likely behaves as he does because he lacks, and then there's characteristics. And the presenter, the trainer from the state, said, see, that's, that's not really depth of knowledge. The new way is, is depth of knowledge. Now, when I went to this session, I promised the person who invited me that I would be very quiet and not say anything. I'm a full-blooded Irishman. My husband says you can always tell an Irish girl, but you can't really tell her much. And I lived right down to it that day, because at this point, I could not be quiet. And I raised my hand and said, that's ridiculous. The new way. It says, which sentence from the passage below tells us that the baker lacked generosity? And then there's four sentences. You're kidding, right? In the old way, the child had to actually read the story. They had to think about what the baker did, figure it out, characterize it, and then make a decision. In the new way, they don't even have to read the story. You said, which of these four sentences below? How can that be better comprehension of a story you don't even have to read? It sort of blew the meeting up. <laughs> now, in Common Core, what they say is, by 12th grade, you're only reading 30% of literature and 70% of the texts are what are called nonfiction informational texts. The federal documents say they include things like menus and how-to manuals, and um, there's a thing about global warming, you know, like government documents. And some of them are historical. And why does that matter? Because Western civilization is transmitted through its literature. When you deny children literature, you're, not, you're actually denying them the ability to participate in Western civilization. Let me give you an example why. You all heard of the lifeboat story? You know, 10 people in the lifeboat, only nine will fit. You have all heard that story? People are looking at me with blank face. Children are presented with an exercise that says there are 10 people in this lifeboat, but only nine will fit. And then they're given the demographics for each of the 10 people, and they have to decide which of the people will be thrown out of the lifeboat so that the other nine can survive. That's the story. I had a friend who taught at Boston College, and his kids all came in having done that exercise, and he reviewed it with them, and they had a very clinical discussion with all the demographics about who should stay in the lifeboat and who should go out of the lifeboat. And then he showed them the original movie, A Night to Remember, which is the original Titanic movie, you know, with Clifton Webb and Barbara Stanwyck, I think, was it? Which is the lifeboat story, right? There's not enough seats in the lifeboat. But these are real people. 
And in the movie, there's a man who dresses up like a woman and he sneaks on to the lifeboat. And they catch him. And they haul him off of the boat. And he says, but, but I'm a businessman. And, and I'm wealthy and a lot of people depend on me. And my life is very important and I really need, which was all the things that the kids said in making these demographic determinations when they did the lifeboat exercise. Except now this is a real human being. And he's contemptuous and a coward. And nobody wants to even talk to him. And then there's the English Dave who has a seat on the lifeboat, because you know she's English royalty. But she gives it up, saying, I've been married to my husband for 60 years, and I'm going to stay with him. And so she picks a, a woman from steerage who has a baby, and she gives that woman the, the seat. And the, all of the, the sailors say, well, you know, we have more important people, at which point the Dame reminds them that she's actually a Dame. Therefore, they have to do what she says because, you know, she's nobility. And not only does she give this woman and the baby the seat, she takes off her coat and gives them her coat so the baby will be born. And that's courage and compassion. And my friend, the professor, says the kids all cry. Because the lifeboat exercise, which was not fiction, engages the computer of your mind and makes it a problem. Literature makes you a person. And it touches your heart soul and awakens all of the things that make us truly human. Abraham Lincoln wants to introduce Harriet Beecher Stowe as the woman who started the Civil War because she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin and put a face on slavery and made Simon Legree forever synonymous with the villain. Except our kids will never know who he was. Because they only get 30% of literature. And English teachers are saying we can't even read a whole novel with that. We can only read little excerpts here and there. The way that they teach it now is we balance the text. Everything is based on the text. That we write from the text. Everything that the kids are supposed to do in the classroom comes right from the text that we give you. No outside information. This is supposed to be where you glean everything. And the example that's used in training sessions all over the country is the text for the Gettysburg Address. And what the teachers are being told is in teaching the Gettysburg Address, the teacher should not talk about why the North fought the Civil War. The teacher should not ask them, have you ever been to a funeral? Do you know what a funeral is? The teacher should not talk about why equality is something worth fighting for. You should only talk about the words of the Gettysburg Address themselves, which is kind of ironic because the Gettysburg Address says, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And this turns that on its head. Now, I went looking just to see what's out there um, in terms of Common Core curriculum because all the districts all across the country are buying books that are Common Core compliant. This is a national publishing house, Carson DeLosa. They've shown up in multiple states as recommended. All of their curriculum is Common Core compliant. This is a fourth grade book. Why did I pick a fourth grade book? Because it's easy to read as opposed to a big high school textbook. And it's easy for you to see it instead of reading 300 pages. So, fourth grade book. This one is U.S. Government and Presidents meant for fourth grade. Starts by saying government is like a nation's family. Families take care of children and make sure that they're safe, healthy, educated, and free to enjoy life. Families encourage children to be independent, hardworking, and responsible. <coughs> Families make and enforce rules and give appropriate punishments when rules are broken. Government does those things for its citizens, too. So they're the parent and you're the child. And then each question is how does your family keep you safe? How does the government keep its citizens safe? How does your family keep you healthy? How does the government keep its citizens healthy? So the kids, these are nine-year-olds, are given a comparison. Government and family are the same. It goes on to talk about what does government do, and it specifies that this is the federal government, and it provides education, communication, safety, protection, transportation, health, health for the needy, clean air and water, and money to trade for goods. And those are all things that the federal government that the kids are taught that the federal government is supposed to do. And most of those things don't happen to be in the Constitution, but they're being taught that this is what the federal government is supposed to do. They go on to say that the government of the United States is a democracy. It's not. We're a republic. Further down, they say, our kind of democracy is a republic. Which is like saying our kind of oligarchy is a monarchy. They're not the same. They're totally different forms of government but they equate them. And then when they go to the next page, the values of the American democracy include services that benefit all and help those in need. So the government is a charitable 
institution. The idea that, that government is to, the function of government is to help the needy is something that's being pushed down. Now, some people may agree with that, some people may not agree with that, but that's a political statement, not a factual one. When it talks about taxes, it says the government needs money to build schools, print money, and help needy citizens. So once again, we've got this theme running through the book. Now, I will tell you I actually read the whole book. It was a fourth grade book. It took an hour. Not a big deal. Most of the book is purely factual. You know, the Mayflower crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They kissed Plymouth Rock. They signed the Mayflower Compact. The Declaration of Independence was signed in July. The Constitution was signed on this date. John Hancock wrote a signature real big. Very appropriate things for nine-year-olds and very factual. So a parent reading the book or helping a little one with homework would not necessarily pick up that there's a theme running through the book. Because this may not be the page that went home that night. Or you would see it once and think, oh, I don't really like that, but uh, it's okay. Just a little thing. Instead, it's a theme running through the whole book. Now the whole back half of the book is uh, biographies of the presidents. They don't bash anybody. And when, they start with George Washington, of course. And they say he was the first president, he was the father of the country, and his wife's name was Martha. And he had false teeth, but they weren't made of wood. All the things you tell a nine-year-old. These kids are nine. Uh, John Adams was the first president to live in the White House, and his wife's name was Abigail. And then you get to Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, when he was president, promised a program that would make sure every American had health insurance. Clinton put his wife Hillary in charge of the program, but unfortunately, it failed. Unfortunately, that's a political statement. And why are we talking to nine-year-olds about universal health care? That's a little over their head. Now, many people say, but this is just the public schools, and I'll homeschool my kid, and I won't escape this. This is New Reader's Press. It's an article from the Washington Times. They, this is the, score boost is the GED test. This is the largest publisher of GED tests in the country. And many homeschoolers get their diplomas through the GED process. So they've revamped their whole GED test to be Common Core compliant. And the way that it works is the students get a source text. Remember we talked about the text. And then it gets followed by a writing prompt. And you're graded on the complexity of your answer. How well did you use the information in the source text? How well do you use facts and figures and data to support your answer? So the source text on global warming says global temperatures are increasing and attributes it to human industrial activity and population growth. Now, they'll have a small problem with that considering what happened at the UN just recently where they couldn't prove any of it. But let's think about this. Everything that the child gets says global warming exists and here's the reasons for it. You're graded on the complexity of your answer. Suppose you don't agree with that political position. You had better know all of the information, all of the facts and figures, all of the data out of your head. Because they only gave you data from one political side of the argument. So if you don't agree, it's a much harder test. Which means kids who don't agree will most probably get a lower score. Not because they didn't write as well, but because they were asked to do something way more difficult than people who did agree. But that GED test score is used to determine what college you get into, whether or how big of a scholarship you get. So we're weeding out people based on a political philosophy, but calling it a writing test. Now, not only is the GED, David Colvin, who's one of the folks who was behind the Common Core Standards, he's now the head of the college board. And he told Education Week, well, we're going to align the SAT to the Common Core Standards. Which means, even if you're in a state that doesn't do this, if the SAT and the ACT and the GED are all Common Core aligned, all the doors to get into college are closed unless you comply. So when they said everybody, they meant everybody. Some folks are saying, well, if we go to a virtual school, it'll be a way out. This is Florida. This was an article from the Washington Times. The school taught a course. Um, it was a virtual online class of world history. And the lesson was called Invisible Warfare. And it said that Islam and Christianity could both use scripture to justify violence. 
and that um, terrorists are folks who are risk takers and suffer from low self-esteem. So joining a terrorist group gives them a sense of belonging, the poor dears. Now, as you can imagine, that made a real ruckus in this Florida town. So the local Florida paper went to the school and said, what are you doing? And the school official said that the content of the course is in line with common course standards and not something the teacher can alter or change. That was the official statement of the school official to the press. Now, Marilyn, when we talked about your data system, you told Washington what your data were, because when you started, you really weren't very far along in developing your data system. So your original grant was like, well, we're trying. We're, we, we do a lot of things well, but we're working on this data system. So in your update, you had to sit in Washington said, tell us how you're doing. Well, you have your unique student identifier. You now have student level enrollment, demographic, and program participation information. You have student level information about where kids in pre-K through um, the end of college, what they do, where they went to school, did they move schools. You can talk to all the colleges. You've audited your data. You have all the test records of individual students. You have records on students not tested. So if they didn't take the test, why all of that is there. You are, by December of 2010, your teacher identifying system would be done. Your transcript information would be done by 2014, and your student level college readiness scores are done. So remember those indicators? That's where you are in implementing them. You also have all of your, um, all the alignment issues. Then you talked about where you're, how you're going to document each of those things. So you told Washington quite completely all of the things that you were going to do to make sure that you have all of the elements of your uh, data system. And you also keep your um, ACT, SAT, PSAT, all of those results are in your kids' database as well. <clears throat> uh, you also told Washington that you already share data with the State Department of Human Resources, the Department of Juvenile Justice, the Department of Public Safety, and higher education institutions, and you will be working to share data with the Department of Labor. So those are all the places that all of the data is shared. It doesn't just live in the Department of Education. We're going to skip that. Now, this is the U.S. Secretary of Education. He went to the Sustainability Summit, and he said, through Race to the Top, this is what they've done to unleash all these programs. And he said that the department is going to take a leadership role in educating the next generation of green citizens. He said, we're going to teach students the science behind climate change. He said, we're going to advance the sustainability movement through education. The obvious question is, how can the federal department of education do that if they can't control what's happening at the local school level? Now, this is creating a lot of consternation. And so the Council of Chief State School Officers in February of this year issued a new document. And what they said was that the Common Core standards are foundational, but they're not sufficient. We need to move to dispositions or mindsets. And they defined that as agency initiative, resilience, adaptability, leadership, ethical behavior. Yeah, we want Washington teaching about that, right? <laughs> uh, civic responsibility, social awareness, and self-control. And that the states for this college career and citizenship readiness should now become the goal of all the education agencies in all the states. So they need to redesign education so that all of those things are internalized from early learning forward. So that every child has all of the right knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And if we have to do that, we'll create individualized learning plans online to make sure every kid complies. Do you remember Achieve? We looked at those earlier. Look at the top. All students should graduate from high school ready for college, career, and citizenship. In Washington, there's a new education bill, Strengthening America's Schools Act, that has 11 co-sponsors. It's already out of committee, and the purpose is to ensure every child has a fair, equal, and significant opportunity to obtain a high-quality education and graduate from high school ready for college, career, and citizenship. So they're moving forward with this. Now, I always like to end with good news. This is my granddaughter, and she's adorable. So I am showing you to her because she's adorable. Also because every one of you has a face that looks just like that in your life. Maybe it's a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew or a godchild or a neighbor or a student in your classroom. In Pennsylvania, the Department of Education testi officials testified in front of our House Education Committee. And what they said was that, well, we need to standardize all this education. You know, it's like when you make widgets 
they all have to come out the same. So I call her Addie, and she is the delight of my heart. But the Department of Education calls her a widget. So I looked it up. A little device or mechanism, especially one whose name is unknown or forgotten. And all of a sudden, it became very clear that in this system, our children are no longer the clients of the educational system. They're the product of the educational system. Well, if they're the product, Who's the client? Who is the educational system in America now designed to serve if this is what they're supposed to produce? See, you don't do things for the benefit of the product. Does anybody think that what they do is for the benefit of the widget? No. You do something to a product for a client. Well, when I look at that little face, I don't see a widget. And I don't want to live in a country where she is the product of some standardized bureaucratic educational system. And I will give every ounce of strength that I have to stop them. And I beg you to join me. Thank you. Well documented. Uh, secondly, um, second question. 
Uh, the question was, what happened to the race to the top money? You had four years to spend it. It's a four-year program, so it comes down. Parts of it had to go to the school districts, and I think in your state, half of it. I think half. Don't focus on that. Every state's a little bit different. But I think in your state, half of it actually went to the local school districts that complied. It paid for um, the upgrade of your computer systems, which was actually quite expensive. It paid for training, that the state's sending out training. You added additional personnel at the state level, so a lot of it just stays in the bureaucracy to, to build this. You have um, a research consortium in your state, so you have a, a bunch of uh, positions that were formed at the Department of Education level that the money was used for as well. All right, and um, where, where do we go from here? How do we actually like the Okay, their question is, what do we do from here? Um, although the legislatures were bypassed in the beginning, that doesn't mean that they don't have a role. Your elected House and Senate can undo anything that the bureaucracy did do, because legislation always trumps regulation all the time. So elected people can make a difference, and they are making a difference. In Pennsylvania, we had a resolution passed um, in our House of Representatives. We have 203 representatives in the Pennsylvania House, and 203 of them voted for it. And the department sort of paid attention because it was unanimous. Now, they're wiggling around. Some things moved. Some things they said moved, and now we're finding out that it didn't. But the point was, when the legislature stands up, this can be changed. In Indiana, the legislature has said we're putting the brakes on it. I right. was speaking to a senator in Georgia who was leading the charge to get them out of it. I testified in Tennessee. The Senate Education Committee in Tennessee is... Uh, looking at withdrawing. State of Florida, the governor has actually pulled the state of Florida out of the park consortium, which since they were one of the founding members is a kind of a big deal. So elected officials can change this, and you should talk there. It doesn't mean you shouldn't talk at your school district level, because your kids are there, so you should certainly do what you can, but understand the districts are tied to this. They don't have a lot of options. The, the, the punishments, Corporate units are very severe, including teachers losing their job and losing their certifications if they don't comply. So that your legislature is your best bet to make a difference in your state, as well as your governor, who unfortunately is for it. However, all elected officials are open to public pressure. So it's a good thing to, everywhere he goes, you should hear about this. What are you doing about it? Did you know? Just keep talking about it. it the important thing is you don't give up. Keep coming back. This will be, if she puts it online, I'll put it on my website as well, which is why I put it back up, download on Truth, and I'll put the documents with it so that you can download them, that way you'll have them, because it's a lot to remember. Um, so as soon as I get it, I'll have my webmaster put it up, and the documents will be there, and it will be called the Maryland Presentation, so it'll be easy for you to see. Uh, download on Truth, the button's called Common Core, so it's very easy. Anything else? Yes? Not every state has adopted Common Core, is that correct? Four states have not. Texas has not, Virginia has not, Nebraska has not, and Alaska has not. Um, they haven't lost any federal money. Pretty conservative areas that haven't adopted those exactly. standards. Yes, but many states that have are now backing up and saying, we want to look again, we're going back and doing it again, and the uproar is growing across the country. As, as, especially when, as it hits the classrooms, and kids are coming home and parents are going, you're doing what? Well, Doc, you mentioned somewhere about kids using spell checkers for yes. their work. And, on the um, assessment. And that's, I've had meetings with other people. You mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation the uh, Gates Foundation. Yes. It's my understanding that they're behind all of this at George Soros, and their whole purpose is to make sure every kid in America has to buy a $300 laptop with the same spell checker and the same uploads to wherever all this information is going. And I, I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, um, Gates isn't the only funder. I mean, to be fair, Google. he's a huge funder of this. And yes, he stands to make an incredible fortune if this goes through. Plus, he has a political agenda that he is pushing very heavily. Exactly. Um, he is not only, he, he's, remember we looked at the website with the National Common Core Standards. He is a huge funder of both of those groups. He is also, however, funding state departments of education. Now, I didn't have time before this presentation to go back through his website to see if he has funded Maryland, but it wouldn't surprise me if he has. Um, when you apply for a, a grant from a foundation, 
then it's just a walk around hand out money. You have to say, this is what I'm going to do with the money, and this is how I'm going to use my money with your money, and then you have to give a report after the fact. So it's a big deal. When Bill Gates funds state departments of education, he is basically controlling the agenda of a taxpayer-funded, taxpayer-supposedly-serving organization that is now holding themselves accountable to a private citizen. Now, I don't know if that's legal in your state. Every state has different rules about that. But he is doing it, and that's something you should look don't at. Don't touch it. But yes, he is a big funder. He is not, don't however, the it. only one. Sorry, sorry. Um, Exxon is big behind this. Westinghouse, GE, there's a whole bunch of these. Some for, we're going to make a lot of money on the back end, and some because they're, this is a way to advance a political agenda. Jack so you've got a whole bunch of Jack different groups coming together. Stand up and which is not to negate the fact that Bill is that's funding it. tons. No. And she's standing up, so we have one more question, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, David, sir. that's it. we got to go. Yeah, you. I'm sorry. I don't Just know your name. I don't to, know your name. To, <laughs> to, to piggyback on that a second, it's, there's definitely plenty on, on our side of the fence, too. I mean, Jeff Bush is a big part of the team. It's a big, huge part. So, yes, he has. Um, my question was this. In dealing with the folks at the Board of Education, the issue has been a whole lot more about, you know, it's here, so what are we going to do next? That kind of an issue. How do we compete with the folks on the board that are, well, what's the big deal? We've always collected data before. It's no worse. Of course it's more rigorous. What's the line that we follow there to get them on the, it, okay, if it isn't that way, fine. If it's not yeah. such a bad thing, why aren't we openly discussing it? Right. Why are your teachers not allowed to discuss it with us? Can I piggyback that because you talked about mental health being growing that. I've been in mental health 15 years. 